if you could say your name, when <coughs> you were born, and where you were born. Uh, my name is James W. Horner. I was uh, born in Fort Wayne, Indiana on July the 20th, 1918. I'm 86 years old. Um, what was your early schooling like? I went to a business college. No, I mean like elementary, high school kind elementary, of thing. Elementary, yeah. I went to uh, the name of the school, mm -hmm. St. Patrick's uh, Catholic School in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, then I went to high school, Catholic Central in Fort Wayne. Then I went to International Business School in Fort Wayne mm -hmm. for about two years. And uh, after I came home from the service, I uh, went to Michigan for two years, mm -hmm. University of Michigan. Well, let's, uh, let's move to your business school. Uh, you're intended then to become a, a business person or yes. have your own business or something? Well, I, I intended to, uh, to work in, um, in the banking industry or something of that nature, which I did do. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But what changed the, uh, your, your direction from college? Uh, the birth of a daughter. Or, oh, okay. Uh, oh, so you got, you got married then? After well, I got home in October of '45. and got married in November of '45. Oh, uh, we're we're still back at business school. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So you're 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 intending then to have a career in banking, or that, or similar to that okay. in business. Okay. Right. All right. But what altered that? What what changed that at that at that time? Going to the service. Okay. Yeah, I see. So that's that's what we want to get into now. Right. right. Um, how did did uh. Pearl Harbor happened and then you were drafted or? No, Pearl Har Harbor happened in, in uh, 1941, December. Right. And uh, I got drafted in 40, uh, 42, okay. I think it was, yes, in okay. June of 42. Well, where were you when you heard the news about Pearl Harbor? In my automobile driving down the street in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah. Were you alone? Alone. What was your reaction? Well, I was going to my uh, girlfriend's house, and of course, uh, I, it was obvious we were at war, and so I, we discussed that, mm -hmm. and uh, I was kind of anxious, really, to, mm -hmm. to, to uh, go to war, not to, to be a fighter or anything, I just was anxious to protect my country. Yeah. Did you have any, I, I, this is going to sound like a stupid question, but this is for the historical record. Sure. Uh, did you have any inkling that America would be going to war before Pearl Harbor? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. That uh, The things that uh, were happening in politics, uh, I had friends that had been on ships out in, uh, in the Pacific, and they told them being fired upon, and... and uh, and returning fire, and uh, there was every indication we were we were going to go to war. We, it, I don't think there was any question about that. But Pearl Harbor was still a surprise, I would take it. Kinda. Really. It it happened, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, so many things were happening at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, none of them were toward peace, right. actually, right. and. Uh, and the, the populace felt that, I'm quite sure. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it might have been underlined, but I know I felt that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just a young kid at the time, really. If the war had not started, did you have any intention of getting involved in the military, of becoming no. a military person? No, not okay. the least. Okay. No. So what was the process then? Uh, Pearl Harbor happens. Uh, there's a draft uh, that, that is instituted. Right. How did you find out? about your number and how did you find out you were going to be drafted? Oh, I just, uh, I don't, I'll tell you the truth, I don't remember my number or anything okay. like that. But uh, one day I received notice that I should report for duty and so I did. Okay. Yeah. What was the reaction of your parents? Well, my father was dead at the time, and but just with my mother. And of course, uh, she didn't like it. but. Uh, I, there was no choice of what, uh, yeah. uh, uh, if you had a lot of brothers and sisters, maybe somebody would be exempted, or if you worked on a farm, you might, or vital industry or something of that nature. But anybody like myself, well, 
um, that was it was all right. Yeah. So let's go through the process. You get the draft notice. What do you do next? Did you have to go to report to a? Oh, I see. Yes, uh, I would give it a date to report. Okay. And uh, it was at the, to a bus in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and a time was like nine o'clock in the morning, and we took the bus. About forty or fifty of us was on this bus, and we went to Toledo, Ohio. Did you know any of these people on the bus? No. Okay. No. Were they basically we, from your area, oh, though? Yes, okay. All from right. Fort Wayne, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, we went to Toledo, Ohio, and were processed there, and uh, put on a train, and went to Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, where we were inducted. When we arrived, we had not been sworn in at the at the uh, induction station. We were just at the. Uh, so you're still in civilian clothes and. Yes. Oh yes. Okay. Uh -huh, yes. So you're sworn in in a large group. Oh yes. Uh -huh. And what happens next? And uh, we took tests. Uh, they were they were in, intelligent tests and, and um, IQ and. Uh, uh, the doctor examined us to see that we were physically fit to, to serve and uh, the typical induction type of uh, things that you'd have happen to you, right. Was there any indication <clears throat> at that time of where you would go within the Army, whether you're going to be an infantry or you're going to be this or that? Did you have not, any inclination? Not in the least, okay. no. no. I had no idea where I'd be assigned. I was at Fort Harrison, Indiana. and. Uh, I just uh, did what I was told there. Uh, I think we issued our clothes and a bunk and uh, you know, barracks and put somebody in charge. And uh, then I, I spent about the first five days on KP in the, in the kitchen. We had uh, my first job, I'll never forget it, was uh, laying up the salt and pepper shakers on the tables. and. Uh, and a ketchup bottle and, a, and that sort of thing. And what I did, I got a, a string, the length of the, the mess hall, and laid that out and had another guy hold it the other end, and we placed the condiments in those, on those lines so they were all in exact line. <laughs> Somewhere or other I thought you were supposed to have things neatly uh, arranged. And uh, I did that for about three or four days. I'll never forget, I'd get up in the morning about uh, 2 o'clock and I'd start making toast. And that was on a rotating kind of a gadget. And you'd put eight or ten pieces of toast in here and go over the hill and come back down and you'd have toast. And we, we were cooking for 5,000 people though. Yes. And uh, so about the third day, uh, this, the officer said to me, he said, well, you shouldn't be a KP, you should be a cook here because you know more than a KP does. So, so I said, well, that's fine, well, I cook. And so I, I'll never forget the first meal that we, one of the meals we cooked was uh, we had turkeys. And then we have 5,000 people, you know. And my, one of my jobs was to cook the peas and carrots. And the peas and carrots were cooked in a great vat. Oh, I opened maybe, I forget how many cases of peas and carrots and threw it in the vat. Six or eight pounds of butter, two or three packs of, of pepper. <laughs> so, you know, just, just mammoth uh, uh, volume. And then I was cooking the turkey, and I'll never forget that. And you know something, I don't think I ate turkey for about uh, 20 years. I couldn't stand to look at the darn things. It was, it was turkey every plate, you know. So I, I worked there at, uh, in that, in that uh, kitchen, and about the fifth day, an officer came in, and he said, uh, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm cooking. I, this is where I told you to come. He said, you don't belong here at all. And I said, oh. He said, no. Uh, we checked your, uh, your IQ and that sort of thing, and uh, you don't belong here. I said, well, where do I belong? He said, you belong in the, uh, the finance school. Because I had been working in a bank before I came. So. And he said, you should be in the finance school. I said, well, fine, where's that? He said, it was right here. So 
I walked out of there, got my stuff, went over and started being in the finance school. Were you still in the same barracks with the same guys and all that, or did they transfer you? During that time, but then okay. when I, but when the school started, then we went into the brick buildings at Fort Harrison, okay. uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. They had brick buildings there, and then I went to school, and, and uh, that's all I did, really, all day long. I went to school, learned all the finance procedures. What about basic training? What about infantry training and gun counts? I never had it. Really? No, oh. I never, ever had basic training. Uh, it was a, quite a surprise, too, at a later time of my life when that came, came to light. But uh, I, I just uh, never had any basic training. We just, all we did was go to school. Hmm. How long did that last, the schooling? A couple months? Uh, about three months. Okay. Yes, about three. And the intention three. was uh, what? To, the intention was to teach me how to do military finance. The military finance, uh, there's always a finance unit attached to an infantry division and other elements also, but an infantry division always has a finance office. And there's about 10 or 12 men in that office. And uh, you figure payrolls, you figure uh, time for people to, that want to go and leave, you, t you figure everything for them and how much money they should receive and how, what their deductions are and so on like that. Now this doesn't have anything to do with procurement of equipment and stuff Not like that? One okay. Bit. It's all, all right. completely money. I got gotcha. you. It's all money. Okay. We compute the payroll and uh, get in the car and go to the bank, get the money and drive back and, and uh, pay the troops. And this is all done by hand? All by hand. Yeah. Every bit of it. Yes. At that time it was all by hand. Every bit of it. Yeah. So obviously you had math skills, you had finance skills oh, that yeah, uh, yeah. They, they recognized. Which I still have, yes. I, I, I envy you. I, I'm yeah. functionally illiterate in math. <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. Um, so after the training, oh, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. While you were in training in finance school, right. did you have any inkling of where you were going? Not a bit. Okay. No, I just knew that after people got trained, they would be shipped out to divisions. Okay. We were, we were uh, slated to go to a division uh, finance office. Did you uh, get access to newspapers, radio reports? Did you know what was going on in the war? Oh, sure. It was, uh, you can get the newspaper at the, the PX. Oh, sure. Now, no, in the uh, early days, it was not a very good picture. I mean, no, no. Uh, does, do, uh, what, what was your reaction and the reaction of the people around you? I mean, MacArthur gets well, kicked out of the Philippines, and yeah, exactly. the Japanese are taking over right. most of China. I, I think just uh, people wanted to do their, uh, their part. I don't think you dwelled on the fact that MacArthur was out or the Japanese did this or that. I think, I think you knew that you had to learn what you were going to do and do it, and you are going to do your job for the, for the service wherever that was going to be. You didn't dwell on that, though. It was just, you, you dwelled on going to the movie at night and, and uh, that sort of thing, you know, playing a baseball game. So there was some recreation, there was some free time? Oh, absolutely. And, okay. Oh, sure. That's, oh, no, you, you, don't, you don't do that in the Army. You, you better be sure you have a morale factor operating. Yeah. At the time, I didn't realize that's what it was, but I do now that that's... That's why, uh, that's why things are planned so well for you. Now, you grew up in, in uh, your early part of your, your schooling, all that, in Indiana. What were some of, just some examples of people that you met that were in your barracks or in your, your group there? Where were they from? Where were they from? Yeah. Well, they were mostly from the Midwest, obviously, because that, the, the uh, induction station was at, uh, at Toledo. And you had people of Ohio and uh, Indiana mostly, some from Michigan, mm -hmm. but mostly they were in, in that area. Okay. As there were induction stations all around the country, and they they just brought in people from from that area to those okay. stations. 
Some of these may sound very obvious, Shiva, but somebody's got to get this information down before it's you know sure. before it's lost. And I've I've run into vets who say that they you know met the first time they've ever met somebody from New Jersey or something. So that always becomes very entertaining because yeah. of their accent. Or, yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, but we we never had people from that far away. Okay. No. Okay. All right. So now you finish your training. Is there any ceremony or a certificate or oh, a graduation? Yes. Oh, sure. or, okay. Oh, absolutely. You you, you graduated and. Uh, you receive a certificate, and they're uh, recognized. Usually, they promote you then to a, a T4 grade, what they call a T4 grade, which is a, the equivalent to a sergeant, but it's a technical grade because you're not leading troops; you're a uh, technician, so it's, a, it's actually a paid uh, operation. Okay. So, so, you, so you started out as a private, like oh, anybody sure, else, absolutely. and now you're a T4. Then I went to T2, and then T4, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, what was your assignment after you graduated? Uh, my first assignment was to go to uh, Camp Blanding in Florida uh, to set up a finance office for the 79th Infantry Division. By set up, are you talking about you and a group? Or a you group, a okay. group, yes. All right. There was a major there and a couple of captains and a lieutenant or two and uh, then uh, enlisted people. There'd be about 14 or 15 of us there. How were you adjusting to military life? Did you did you enjoy it, or was I, it just? I had no trouble with it at all. Okay. Really, I didn't really. I had. Uh, uh, I didn't do any better. Maybe. I just. I just. Uh, just accepted what was there. As I said, they put me on KP, so I'd do KP as long as they wanted me to. It didn't make any difference to me. It's uh, that's been kind of my life too, though. I I accept things right now, and and. Uh, and Get, get along with it. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> what was the process of setting up this office? I mean, you've got desks, you've got typewriters, you've right. got, uh, yes. and uh, you're assigned a, a desk, and then yeah. in the morning, uh, let's get a, a visual idea of right. what you, what your job was like. Right. You, you come in in the morning, you sit down, right. assignments are given to you. I mean, how, how yes. did that work? Well, uh, <clears throat> usually uh, a major was in charge, and he, he was just he was the in charge, so you never talked with him. But then he'd have some lieutenants and some what we, oh, master sergeants, what we called, and uh, they were kind of, they ran the office. And uh, my job might be uh, calculating uh, a pay for a regiment or for a, a battalion, and I'd calculate the, the pay of each man uh, because there are so many different ranks and grades in that in that unit. And I'd calculate the, uh, the pay for them, and if they were, if they were deducted for this cut or something, you had to take that into consideration. And so we paid once a month. And so it would take us about uh, two to three weeks to put the payroll together. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was a method of, of getting the payroll, uh, the total payroll, and you had all the names and all the amounts of money people were to, to get. And then you had to determine how many $20 bills you had to get, and how many tens, and how many fives, and ones, and up to, all through the change. And at the, end of, at the end of that operation, when you made the payroll, because the payroll was sent out to the different units. We didn't actually pay people. We prepared to pay for them, put it in, in bags, and gave it to them. And in that, in that bag of money was the exact change, et cetera, et cetera, for each man. And uh, it wasn't counted that way, it was just in there. And that was up to the, uh, the dispersing officer to pay it that way. And that was the, that was the uh, method of, of, uh, of paying. This was all done by uh, adding machines. And we didn't have calculators, even. we just had adding machines. And uh, it was all done by, by mathematics. Mm -hmm. So, how long did this particular assignment last? I lasted at uh, Fort, Bla Fort Blanding, uh, Fort Blanding, yeah, Camp Blanding is actually what it was. Uh, that lasted about, uh, oh, maybe five months. And uh, then they do the Army, when they have that, and they're expanding the Army, or the military, any place. When they're expanding, they take what well, would be, I was considered a seasoned person because I had operated there for five or six, four or five months, maybe six. 
and then they assigned me to a brand new division that was going to be formed. And a, a group of us, maybe four or five of us from this office, would go there and start forming the office for a new division. And uh, I left Fort uh, Camp Blanding and went to a, a fort or a camp over in Texas, uh, Camp Howells, Texas. And uh, that was out in above uh, Dallas, mm. around, uh, yeah, above Dallas. And uh, we formed then, and it was just big wide open spaces, really. They were building, still building the things under the, the, the huts and all that. So is this living in tents? At this time, they had already constructed some shacks or okay. some uh, housing units. They weren't brick, they were just uh, tar paper things, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we had, uh, then uh, five we have, and then they'd send us new men from the school. And then we'd train them. Okay. So we, that's where, I, that was at Camp House. That was the second uh, place I went. Now, is this where you're getting a more of a mixture of people from around yes, the, the country? Yes, no, that, that's okay. where you get them. You met your first Texans? And... That's where you get them, right there. Right, <laughs> exactly right, yeah. Were there any, at that particular time, were there any uh, friendships formed with individuals? Or were you too busy yeah. working? Or? No, no, you had friendships, absolutely. You, uh, you had time, like on the weekends, you'd, you could go and uh, visit different places and uh, in Florida and we'll go over to different tr attractions and we two or three of us would go you know and just go for the weekends. Well days. basically the finance people. You just kind of all, all, oh yes, yeah. just those okay. people. Yes, uh, right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so when did it, uh, when was the assignment to go <clears throat> overseas? Was it fairly soon after that or was there another oh, step no. in between? Oh yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I left, I was a uh, 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 a uh, technician at, at Camp House. And so uh, at Camp House, I noticed that uh, I'd stand in line to go to the movies. I'd always stand in line. And I noticed that the officers could just go to the head of the line and walk in. And I thought, that's where I want to be, <laughs> to one of those guys. And so a bulletin came out and it asked if anybody wanted to volunteer to go to Officer Candidate School. And of course, I put my name on there. And I didn't even know what school it was, frankly. And it turned out it was the infantry school at uh, Fort Benjamin, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, that's where I went. And I, I got accepted to go there. To was there a test that you took or anything like that, or was it just you applied? Oh, just applied, yeah. So they yeah. must have had some kind of a, a way of looking up your records and seeing what oh, you're, yes, okay. Sure, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, so I, I think that, I think they, they recognized uh, that I had gone through the school, that I had some ability in, in that manner, and, and uh, that I had some semblance of uh, leadership, if that's what you call it, that uh, I was able to direct other people. And uh, so I think that's why I went to the uh, to that school at Fort Benjamin, uh, Fort Benning. So when you went to Fort Benning, was the school more in terms of officer training, leadership, or more well, finance? It's officer candidate school. Finance was over. I was now infantry. It was, uh, I was no longer in finance. <coughs> I, I was now in, in uh, an infantry uh, environment. But, well, uh, what was involved in the training then? <coughs> at, at Fort? Uh, yeah, Benning. Uh, well, before the training, it might be interesting if okay. you want to hear yeah, this. Okay, yeah, I do. Uh, <coughs> at, uh, at our class, there are about 210 people in the in an infantry class, and they come from all all different units. You know, some are also, uh, some are uh, sergeants that were in areas where they didn't want to be anymore, so they applied to go to mm -hmm. the school. There was a way of getting transferred to another unit actually for them, and uh, there was a group like myself. We were just green guys, and. Uh, it was on a Thursday there, the first Thursday that I was there. The school was to start on Monday, the next following Monday, uh, the class, the, the classwork and so on. And so uh, they post the uh, jobs for everybody. And my name came up as the company commander. 
I about died. I had, I had no idea. I hadn't had any infantry training. Here I am at an infantry school, learning to be an infantry officer, and I had no idea what they wanted. So there was an old sergeant there from uh, up in, in uh, Boston. He came out of Boston. McCarty, is, McCarty, his name was. And, uh, he said, you know, he said, you look frightened. I said, I am. I said, I'm the company commander and I don't have the slightest idea what I'm supposed to do. He said, well, maybe I better go out and help you. So he took me out on, this was Thursday, so on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, we went out into the woods and he, and he said, now, it's your voice that you have to have your voice carry. And so he said, there are ways to make that happen. And so he said, now here's what we'll do. And he said, uh, Take and look at this tree. There was a large tree there. He said, think of that as a unit, and, and you're going to command it. He said, and the way you're going to command it by saying different um, words. He said, the words will be Hong Kong, Ning Long. He said, I'm out there shouting at the tree, you know. I don't know if I'm making a fool of myself or not. But anyway, he was, he was very sincere. And... Then I said to him, well, what happens that morning when, a, when a, everybody's out there? He said, I'll write it on a piece of paper for you, the directions of what to do. And so he wrote it all down, and I had it in my hand, that, so now it's the first day. And I'm out in front, and uh, the uh, uh, platoons are all lined up, four platoons, platoon leaders, uh, just the whole work, you know, everybody has their job. And so... <laughs> I would, the, the, um, the, the sergeant turned the company over to me, see? And here they all are standing there, you saw And I looked at the machine and it said, uh, uh, call them to attention. So I go, company, hit, hut! And all, and all these guys snapped around and stood, and I thought, my God, here they are. Everybody's, everybody's standing there, and I did the pay to get there. And I thought, well, so I thought, the next one is uh, right shoulder arms. So I gave them that. And everybody bang, bang, up the window, and everything, everybody at the same time. Um, they had all trained. I had no idea. I turned the unit, marched it down, gave forward march, turned one corner, turned another corner, moved them down the road, and put them on trucks. And, well, about four or five TAC officers ran over and said, Candidate, what the hell do you think you're doing? I said, I'm putting them in a truck to come with us, I said. We got a Jeep, two Jeeps, and we went down to the headquarters. There was a major in there. And they said, stay right here. So I, they went in and talked to him, and they, they came out and said, you go in and report to the major. <coughs> so I did. And I said, uh, Kennedy Horner, reporting in order, you know. He said, uh, what happened out there? I said, well, sir, uh, I've never had any basic training, but I asked a sergeant, an old-time sergeant, to help me. And he gave me, on a sheet of paper, the commands. He, he said, yes, the tech officer said, you're reading the commands off of a piece of paper. <laughs> he said, well, he said, no, that's fine, that's all. And I turned and walked out. I still didn't even turn and walked out. Went back now to the unit. I thought, well, by the time I get back to the barracks tonight, my bed will be all in a corner and all my stuff will be in a bag and I'll be going home, see. And uh, I got back to the barracks and my bed was there and all my clothes were still hanging there. And I thought, well, it would probably go happen tomorrow. You know, I didn't have any idea. You know, I, I knew I'd done something. And I, from that moment on, I never ever had another assignment in that unit. Ever. They, they didn't ask every you'll have all these classes every day and how, uh, how to fire weapons and uh, mortar, uh, adjusting mortar fire, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And no, not once did they ask me how to do that. I just sat in the class and just, just sat there. It learned, mm -hmm. but I just sat there. And uh, at the end, at the end of the, of the cycle, they have the magic major pro, uh, uh, problem of, to, that the whole unit's involved in. 
And my, my job for that, I'll never forget it, was I was the assistant ammunition carrier. I wasn't even the ammunition carrier, I was the assistant. <laughs> this is for maneuvers? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And that's all. And I saw that so many times uh, about that experience. And I think that uh, that officer, that major, he made a, a great decision, truly. He thought that, I think he said, and I don't mean this egotistically or anything okay. like that, but I think he, he made a decision that this, this man could lead. He took over and did, he did. Mm -hmm. And I learned after that 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 is the, the motto of the infantry, do something. Do something. And, and uh, I, found, I found out later that I had done something. And it was, no matter what it was, he judged that I, that, was a, that was a leadership problem and a leadership uh, solution. And I, I think he felt that. So that was the experience of, of my basic training, really. <laughs> Yeah. Thank goodness for that sergeant, too. Yeah, yeah. He would, yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. So what happened after that assignment? Where did you go from there? Uh, from there, uh, they sent everybody to different assignments. Some people went to be on the stage in New York. Uh, one, one of the men in the unit was a uh, choir director for, the, uh, for a choir out in, a, 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 a colored uh, choir out in uh, New York. Uh, I wish I could name it. I can't think of the mm -hmm. name of it. Wonderful man. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were all very good friends mm -hmm. then, you know. Actually, after three months of being together and helping each other, you, you become pretty close with those mm -hmm. guys. So my, my assignment was to go to the uh, 90th Infantry Division. And they were out on the, uh, the uh, Mojave Desert in maneuvers. And so I was sent to the 30th Infantry Division, along with about five or six hundred fellows. Were you, had you ever been in the desert before? No, no, uh, no. Only. How was that experience? <laughs> Different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, the desert is, um, let's see, I, I, I graduated in September from infantry school. And I had like two weeks that I could go home and settle any things that had to be that done at that. And then I was forward, uh, I went, and about five of us got in one fellow's car and we drove to, to California. And uh, at that time, it was now about October, and it took us about two weeks to find a unit. So now we're coming up into November, really, and that's when I first got to the unit. And uh, there was lots of it, maneuvering on the desert is huge masses of men going every direction. And, uh, and you'd sleep on the desert floor at night, you know. And, uh, but by finding your unit, you, you mean that you were literally driving around this huge well, well, area? To... Well, we, we, had, we reported. Okay. And at the time we reported, the unit had, was on the move. And so uh, now at this time, uh, we're just all second lieutenant's infantry. Mm -hmm. And so when we finally got to the unit, then that's the first assignment I got, was to the 357th Infantry Regiment and the 1st Battalion. And uh, keep in mind that always in any operation, initial operation, the, the method of committing people is always the 1st and 2nd Battalion, the A Company, B Company, A Company, the 1st and 2nd Platoon, <laughs> is always last, it's not the 3rd and 4th, it's always, that's just the method they do to, to start an operation. It's very common, sometimes it's different, but that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. And so I was an A Company in the 1st Platoon. I had the 1st Platoon of A Company. So you're in charge of how many men? 39. Okay. 39 men, yes. Now. Jim, the, you're training in desert now, desert, okay. Right. Now, are you starting to think about where you might be going next? Not really. Really? No, you, no. Uh -uh. It, uh, no, at that time, we were still out in Italy, 
And it was barren country. I, I, you know, we were fighting the Ramos out in there with uh, Patton and all that. Mm -hmm. And it was sand country. And, mm -hmm. well, but the trading area had to be there because that's the only place in the United States we had trading areas. We had them down in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And that was a different type thing. That was swamps, et cetera. Right. And uh, maybe that's why we were on the... the but desert. you still really had no... You, you, you no. weren't talking amongst each other? No, well, I guess no. we're going to North Africa. Oh, or no, 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 Okay. No. Right. No, no, not really. It didn't, you were just there doing what you were supposed to do right then. I don't think there was a whole lot of conversation or even worry about that. You were all together, and that was important. Okay. And that, uh, but I don't, I don't ever remember thinking, well, now I'm being trained here because I'm going to go to Africa. I know I, nothing like that. <laughs> so what was the training like for you? You mentioned earlier that you've never had basic training. You really didn't go through any kind of maneuvers and right, all that. Right. What about now? Were you actually involved in getting these 39 guys to move here? And yeah, then oh, go? yes, oh, yes. All right. but, but now I'm, a, now I'm a member of a company. And that company commander says, uh, "Who do you take your platoon and go there?" Uh, we don't go there to to, to do calisthenics. We move there in in the company formations. I I, I learned uh, squad maneuvers. I learned uh, platoon maneuvers, etc. And uh, as as time goes on, you learn company and battalion maneuvers. But at that time, all I was interested in was that that uh, platoon I had. Mm -hmm. and, I'd move them around, and uh, an infantry platoon has uh, uh, usually three squads of uh, about 12, 12, 13 men each. Yeah, three. And uh, you learn the maneuver of, of uh, putting two, two squads on line, and the third platoon would be the uh, uh, rescue platoon, if you want to call it that, or the Reserve. The, the reserve, yeah. the, commi the committed for reserve, right? What kind of equipment are you carrying? Well, let's start with you. What were you? What did you? What were you wearing? What were you carrying? At the on the desert? Yeah. A canteen, khakis, a weapon. You had a forty-five or? At that, oh, at that time, I, I was still with. I had a carbine. Okay. Yeah. At that time, I had a carbine, and uh, I mean, I ran around with them woods. And, uh, Did they have packs? Yes, well, I had packs. Oh, you had packs too. Oh, sure. Okay. Yes, All right. because that's how that's where your your clothes were. You, mm -hmm. What you're gonna, what you had is what you had. <laughs> you didn't. You weren't going to a barracks at night. You were at the end of the day that um, the mess trucks had come up. You'd, you'd get your tin can full of food. So you water. had the traditional army mess kit that, oh, sure. that had the, 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 the drinking on the, the top of the bottom. Yep, yep, yep. That, I've used those yeah, before. Yeah. And uh, that was that was all part of it. Sometimes uh, you might go into an area and fire weapons just to... In theory, in, theory, in, in the maneuvers on the desert, you were supposed to be fighting another unit. And we were fighting the uh, 94th Division. That was our uh, opposition. And and if you didn't get a good grade on the on the desert, you stayed there. And the ninety fourth was just like a permanent. <laughs> you went there, they never did get out of the desert. <laughs> but uh, but they uh, I shouldn't say that. Right? Maybe well, that. maybe all you guys were so good that they yeah. just <laughs> no, maybe maybe not. But they 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 really had a hard time getting yeah. out of there. Yeah. And uh, it, it was interesting because they were there a long time. And, and uh, sometimes, you know, in these rifle fire, you're firing blanks, and sometimes they'd be firing some live rounds at you, you know. And, uh, they just got fed up with being there, you know. Maybe that's why they're there so long, too. <laughs> they, they weren't following them. Jim, this, uh, this, you know, may sound stupid, but, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we played army games in the backyard, and, you know, we had all of our stuff. <clears throat> but for a child of, you know, 10, 11 years old, you're, you're full of the fantasy of it all. Yeah. Did you have any inkling of the danger that you were about to get in while you're doing these maneuvers? I mean, you're, you're doing real maneuvers with real guns and yeah. real circumstances. No. Okay. Not in the least. I did have a time when I had, and you'll come to that, but, but that was the, I had no idea that, that people were going to shoot at you. No, 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 we were, it was, not play, but it was all put on. Mm -hmm. You know, 
oh, we'll run around here and try and get a back of these guys, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it wasn't, you had no inkling of, of warfare. They tried to make it as much that way, yes. I, I do, one of the things I'll remember is that, and I never knew why, but now I, but I finally eventually did, we were always going up in areas where there were cargo nets. And a cargo net is a square like this down and down and, and climb up and climb down, climb up and come down. Climb. And I always wondered, well, what are we doing this? And I found out why. But, uh, but at that time, uh, that was a, one of the big exercises was to go up and down that cargo net. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, later on, I found out the reason we did all that. Sure. Yeah. So this training lasted for uh, several months? It lasted months. until, uh, no, oh. until uh, about December, December uh, 24th. Okay. Of 40? 40 of 43. Three, yeah. okay. Yeah. And yeah. What, how did you find out you're going somewhere else? Did somebody come by and talk to you? Or well, you... No, the, the uh, well, just we were alerted to, to move. And there was a railhead out there, and the division went down and got on trains. And our move was to uh, uh, Fort uh, Dix, New Jersey. What are we talking in terms of numbers of, you, you see you're, you're mobilizing now to get on the train. We're right. talking about just your group, or are we talking about the whole? We're the whole division. Oh, wow. So this is a Six, large number of? 16,000 people. Wow. In a, in a division, an upstream division, there's 16,000 people. Right. And, and so down the line, the word gets passed, we always go and then you have your group that you've got to make sure that those guys all, are on this particular train and row, sure, get right. them all seated and exactly. get their stuff put away. And That's correct, right. How long did it take to travel, and where did you go? We went from, uh, it took five days to cross. Uh, we left there on the day after Christmas. And we got in New Jersey, uh, New Year's Eve day. Okay, let me hold on for a second. Do you have to change tapes or something? Or? Oh, okay. Um, you arrived in Jersey? Yes, uh, Fort Dix, <laughs> right, yeah. Because that's where we go to, to uh, embark out of, uh, out of uh, New Jersey. Well, how about now? What, are, are there any, is there any scuttlebutt going on about where you're going or? At that, no. Still no? There never was. Okay. But when we got to New Jersey, we were, we were recognized we were going to go to Europe. Oh, okay. You could, you could sense that at that time. Okay. You weren't, uh, you know, you knew that there was much movement toward, toward Europe at that time. This was right. in, uh, this was in, uh, as I say, we got there New Year's Eve, and we were there until about uh, latter February or March. Okay. And during that time, we uh, would we'd have uh, rifle practice, going marches, that sort of thing. So in New Jersey, there's a there is a, a training base of. Well, yeah, Fort uh, okay. Fort Dix. Dix, okay. Yeah, Fort Dix, okay. A big a big area. Yes, okay. For, for training. Uh, were you briefed? As an officer, were you briefed about where you're going to go next and your men are going to go and all that, or is it still Eventually. pretty much? Eventually. Okay. Not at this time. Okay. So, not at this time. We were just said that we were going to, we were going to ship out of there. It wasn't any talk as even where, because you weren't supposed to say where you're going, and so right. nobody even talked about that. Right. So it was made clear to you right down through the ranks that this is, that there's, you have to keep seeing loose lips exactly. sink ships well, that and a, that whole... And they do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people recognize it because they're going to be on one of those ships. Yeah. <laughs> they do that, yeah. 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 All right, so when did you, or not so much when, but uh, how did you find out that you were going to go overseas? Well, uh, well, when we got to Fort Dix, we knew we were going to go overseas. Right, but then how yeah. did you know where you were going? Well, or? at that time, of course, then the orders came down and what ships we were going to be on and... And uh, it, it, the units were all identified as to what was what ships were going to be on, what what uh, unit on the ship would be the uh, police company that would keep order of the man and so on, and that all came out. And you, you just, uh, in fact, I was in my platoon. Uh, we were we were a police unit on the, on our ship that we were on, and uh, we just kind of kept order and, and uh, saw to it that the men were taken care of properly. Now, I've interviewed a number of, of uh, veterans that traveled across those same waters, and some of them were in 
squalid troop type ships, other ones were on luxury yeah. liners. Yeah. I mean, how, how did you travel over? We traveled on uh, uh, a British ship, the Dominion Monarch. And it was, um, our regiment was on there, so it carried about uh, 4,000 men. And uh, we were in a convoy. And the convoy travels at the rate of the slowest ship. That's the rate of speed. And the con that convoy had merchant vessels in it, destroyers, submarines, all ours, protecting the route. It took us uh, 21 days to cross the Atlantic. You knew there was other submarines out there too, though. Oh yes, that's why okay. we had our. Yeah. Uh, and every now and then you'd see these destroyers. You know, they'd rev up and sail out across some place, and they'd be throwing those tin cans over, you know, and all that. So you recognize that there were submarines out there. Still and, no sense of danger. Not really. Okay. No, not, not really. It, uh, it. You're just going, and you knew all that protection was there, and. You felt it, and uh, I did anyway. I didn't. Uh, I didn't sense that uh, there was any peril in crossing. No. So it takes you 21, 21 days. days to cross. Uh, or where did you arrive? Uh, I believe Southampton. Okay. I believe Southampton. I'm not sure, but I. I in think England, so. though. Oh, oh yes, yeah. in England. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is your first time ever stepping onto foreign oh, soil. Yes, so exactly. how was that experience? Well. You, you didn't recognize it as such. It, this is where you're supposed to be, and you were there. You knew that this is, uh, you're that much closer to the war. You recognize that, of course. You knew about the Battle of Britain. You knew about the exactly. bombings. You and all that. Okay. Okay. Right. Yes, all right. Right. yes. Yeah. And we were stationed out. Uh, our battalion was put out into a, a place, uh, a huge farm called Get Acres. Get Acres. I've gone there since, and it's, it's, a, great, it's a great area, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so there's a farmhouse, and then you guys bivouacked out on tents? Out, out in the tents. Okay, so pup tents or? Yeah, we all had uh, two-man tents. Okay. Right? Yeah. And uh, then we'd, 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 do, we'd do exercises there, uh, our calisthenics, we'd do that a couple times a day. We'd take road marches and so on, just to stay in shape. You know? Was there any interaction with the British? Not a bit. Okay. Not one bit. So you guys were probably insulated? Exactly. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. yeah. We, we had no. The only, in, the only interaction with the British was when we went to the pubs. Okay, yeah. well, yeah. And, what was uh, the reaction of the Yanks was, being in these? It, well, they were, we were spending money, yeah. and they accepted that. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of looking for girls and, and uh, a lot of that sort of thing. And uh, you got into a pub and, and uh, they're great for darts, and so they'd always say, well, "Come on and play darts." And you know, it was, it was uh, nothing nasty. It was right. all oh, just glad to see you were here. And now, were these soldiers, British soldiers, that are no, in there? No, oh, this is just a, okay. Civilians, oh, it's civilians. civilians. Okay. Just civilians, not soldiers. Just okay. civilians. Yeah. All right. No, we had we had no contact with the British soldiers. Okay. No. All right. So um, the calisthenics, the training. What was the next step? What what happened next? Well, then we re we received notice that uh, we're going to, to uh, go to uh, uh, France, and uh, I get I, I take a, we had there were so many officers that were so they should not have been. See, but as an example, our our battalion commander, he's a lieutenant colonel. And he had little knowledge, really. And he said, now he said, uh, he called the officers in. And, and uh, he said, now we're going we're to uh, pack up our things. And on your, on your bags and so on, uh, stencil uh, so-and-so, Etusa, E-T-O-U-S-A. He had, ah, apparently that's a town in France, he said. <laughs> he didn't recognize it was ETO, the United States of America. You know. He said, apparently that's a town in France, he said. You know, that, those little things stuck in your mind. You thought, my Lord, this is the guy leading me, you know. <laughs> and so, but we, well, we all packed and uh, got our men all organized and, and uh, got on 
got out of the camp site. Now, since you're an officer, were you briefed on where you're going and? Uh, uh, not, not quite yet. Okay. Not quite yet. Because we know what's coming. Yes. I mean, this oh, is yeah. one of the greatest invasions yes. in the history, oh, yes. and it was one of the greatest secrets as well. Yeah, exactly. And you had, to, and we were eventually when we got to the next stage. Okay. And that's when, uh, at that time, that's when the guy told us that ETO was uh, a town. But at the same time, that's when the briefing came as to what units were going to do, what and where, and when, and. Uh, how many units were going to be on board ship, and uh, the ship that you were on. They were all, oh, those were all things that you were told. Jim, yes. once again, I apologize if this sounds like a stupid question, but did you have any idea of the scope of what you were being involved Not in? Not the least. We just knew we were part of something. I did finally recognize it, but at that time, I did not. No, no, we were just... We were just going. And yeah. you had to focus on the immediate men around you. You had to focus on the people that you had to do your job. I, I had to take care of my men. Okay. I didn't care about the two next to me. I just took care of my people. And I saw to it that they had everything that they should have. Did you know at this, during this briefing, did you know that you are going to be stepping down off of ships, getting into boats, going on to the water? Not really. Not yet. Not okay. Yet. No, you did, that just happened to you. Really? That's remember when I told you we were doing these cargo nets. Yeah. Then, then we come to that. We got on, we were on board. We walked on board, you know, on the ship. We walked on board. But to leave the ship, we had to go over cargo nets. And that's the first I recognized it. That's why I was taught so <laughs> much about how to go down a cargo net. <laughs> because I'll tell you, that's a very dangerous thing. It, uh, you have to go down the whole side of the ship. That net is... I don't know how far. Well, the whole side of the ship down to the sea. Yeah. And down at the sea are the uh, LCIs, the landing craft infantry boats. And, and he's doing this and, yep. and this. And uh, people would fall off of it, get knocked into the side of the boat, into the side of the LCI, and sometimes wouldn't make it, sometimes would. It just, that was the. That was the first experience, really. But uh, when we got, see, we floated around for about two or three days because the weather was such, mm -hmm. and we, uh, it was bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were thinking of putting off the invasion, actually. You know, th this part is portrayed in, in some of the classic movies right. um, where the guys are standing around, they're sitting around on the ship smoking cigarettes or whatever, and they're, you know, we're supposed to go today, and then all of a sudden you're not going to go today. Did that happen? I mean, was that? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was one of the, one of the really <coughs> moments that I, I'll never forget was that. We were on a ship, and it was about, we were about ready to, to get on the ladder. And they had it over everybody at a time, you know. And I had 39 guys around me, and they, and one of them said, uh, well, Lieutenant, don't you think we ought to say a prayer? And I said, you know, I think we will. And I had in my pocket a little Bible, a little Bible, not, not a huge number of things, just a, a little thing. And it had, uh, it had the 23rd Psalm in there. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's the one who will walk in the valley Shadow, of that. Yeah, a, yeah. A, 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 and so I said, I, I'll read this to you. And boy, I'll tell you, uh, there were tears. There was everybody. Was, and, and we all were the same, really, at, uh, because we didn't know. At that point, we suddenly realized that this was pretty serious yeah. at that point. And, uh, we went over, loaded into our LCI. And you have full packs on. You're oh, you're loaded for bear. Oh, oh everything. So you they, see that in the movies they too. Some ammunition just, yeah. and, and ammunition and food and water, everything on your back. Everything you have is on your back. One of the infantrymen that was there on D-Day, the first you know the first day at Omaha, mm -hmm. talked about guys slipping off of the rope and literally sinking down. Exactly, exactly right.
So you actually I didn't saw. Ha I didn't have that. You guys, you guys we, all got on. Board. We got into boats, but okay. some of our guys, some of the, a couple of my guys, slipped off of the net and fell in the length of the ship down into the water. And all that, uh, all that equipment on them, you know, I, it wasn't nice. But that's what. So happened. they went down completely. Yeah, so, yes. So how many did you end up with on the boat? I, the boat holds thirty-nine men. Right. The Delcii, and I probably had about thirty-five. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, about, I'd say about 35. This is choppy, rocky water. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's stories about the, guys getting sick. Oh, um, yeah, oh, yeah. You were sick on board the boat going over. You know. And then what happens is, see, that boat pulls alongside the cargo net, and it loads. And then it goes back out and makes a huge circle. Uh, it gets in with other boats that have already been loaded. And you just go in a big circle until the whole group is off the ship ready for the assault. Then, then they break out in a straight line and go ashore. Jim, yeah. the scope and the magnitude of oh. this operation must have oh. dawned on you at this point. It did at that time. Finally did. And I'll tell you what. And I can imagine, I, I, to this day, I can imagine the Germans in, the, in their bunkers and so on. They went to bed on June the 5th. And there's nothing out there. And June the 6th, they look out there, and there's 5,500 ships. 5,500 ships that came from all over the world. And they were in their berth. They were assigned. Imagine this. Can you imagine such an outburst? Whoever thought of that, I'll never. I'll, that guy was smart. Because, <laughs> because these, these, and they're not just little boats, they're ships. All of, 5,500 of them were there, all lined up. Imagine the Germans waking up the next morning looking out there and saying, what, what's this? <laughs> but that's what it was. It was just, and they had everything there. Carriers, they, they, everything was there. It, we, the Navy was there, just destroyers and battleships. And the battleships especially were about um, three or four miles offshore firing their, their weapons. So or let's, let's get a visual and, a, and an audible. Uh, there's noise going on now. Oh, the tire there's noise. All these, all these ships are firing. So even as you're stepping down off of the, oh, to get yes. this, they're already firing. Oh, so you're sure, going, okay. absolutely. And the aircraft are going over and uh, and, and uh, taking out positions and dropping their bombs and oh, it's that absolute chaos at that time. And you know, you all had to, every person, every unit had their designated area that they were to get to, and. I'll never forget, uh, after this, I was told, I heard about it, but at the time I, I happened with it, uh, there was an officer by the name of Teddy Roosevelt. He was a Brigadier General and the, and the son of the, the President oh. Roosevelt. And he was one of the officers in charge of our unit. And uh, we landed, uh, the Navy put us ashore about a mile or a mile and a half off of our designated landing area. And so now we're all coming ashore. We had no fire coming at us. We just came ashore. Down this way. That's where the fight was. And Roosevelt looked that around and he, he saw what was happening. We're all there. We're ashore. And he came out and told all the, the commanders, he said, uh, well, the fighting's down there. Let's go down there. And we turned the whole unit in that direction and went down the beach. We went down to the, to the uh, area. Were you in Higgins boats or some other LS? LCI. LCIs, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. They were made by Higgins. Lady I interviewed a guy who yeah, yeah. brought the demolition team yeah, on yeah, one of those right, things. Right, yeah. Right. yeah. Landing craft infantry. Yeah. yeah. So let's get, an, let's get a visual image now. You're, you, you're actually heading towards the beach, but the fighting is not there. Not there, no. Okay, but you're hearing it and you're seeing oh, no, off yeah, the distance. It's all, it's the all desert, there. But that's where we were landing. So then, did the boats just shift over and no, we you, went you landed? You went ashore. We went ashore. That's so you right. actually landed on the beach without any opposition. Exactly right. Yeah. Wow. Not a bit. We turned and then we got opposition. Well, yeah. Well, but, but yeah. At, the, at that point. Yeah. And that was the first. That was now that I'll come to that point. I said about fire. The first round. That I heard thump into the area I was. I suddenly realized that 
somebody was shooting at me. And that's the first time I turned to become an infantry officer because I had, no, I had no feeling about that up to that time, but I suddenly realized that somebody was trying to kill me. And I changed my whole attitude at that point. That was first rounds, uh, that's all, and I said, hey, if it's not us, it's gonna be them. Yeah. And that's, that, that was the first time that I recognized that, I think you asked me earlier about what did you yeah. come in to realize about combat, and that was the first moment. That first round that came at me, I suddenly recognized that. Uh, Let's try and get a, a visual image. You're you're still with your full packs and all that, so you didn't have to land in the water and struggle in the water. Oh, you yeah. guys, oh, oh no. you did. Oh yes, yes. They put they didn't put you ashore. They put you on. We landed out and uh, see we had impregnated gas impregnated clothes on, besides our regular clothes. And you landed in the water. Well, then you just you were, uh, you could sink really. You, you, you had so much uh, pack on, yeah. and so much, uh, so much equipment. Yeah. And and then this and then this, this greasy wear that you had on got in inside it and inside your uh, clothes and inside your body to your body, and that would pull you down. You see. Because that was, uh, it was gas impregnated. Why, the, why gas impregnated? I don't understand. Oh, well, they thought we were going to have gas attacks. Oh. Well, we had gas, uh, gas masks. Masks, that's the, right, sure. yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. And our clothes were impregnated for, uh, for gas attack. Okay. And uh, so that, that all, oh, a lot of, uh, some people would drown out there because they couldn't get up, they couldn't get, and they, they put us ashore about, oh, uh, well, we were, I'd say, hip to waist, uh, waist deep in water. And of course the waves would come in, and, you know. But uh, I'd say it was that at, at least that. Yeah. So out of your 35 guys, did they all make it to the beach? Yes, most okay. of those guys, yeah. We okay. all did at that time, okay. yes, 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 yes. So now you're on the beach, yeah. and there's people on your right, on your left, just exactly. scattered, and more people coming in, more exactly. people coming in. Exactly. Um, but the noise is off to the side. You're yeah. not. You're not actually. We're not being in shy. the noise. Okay. No, no, no. So, an officer comes by and says, "We're heading in this direction." Exactly. And That's you start marching in the we, sand. We start. We 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 didn't just march in a column. We spread out. Spread out. You know, okay. And, uh, and uh, in a in a formation you'd fight with. You know. It was. You never kept people closer than five uh, yards apart uh, because of a mortar around to come in, and you had them closer, you'd lose more people, so you always kept people about five yards apart. So as you're moving forward with, with this whole group of people, you're coming in from the side now, exactly. as the rest of the guys are coming in exactly right. full frontal assault, right. Right. and this is when you heard the thump oh, yeah. somewhere around there. Then exactly. what happened? I mean, what, did you get into the thick of it at that point, or was well, it gradual? Or? It, oh, well, the, the thick of it was later on, actually. Okay. We, find it, we, we, we got into a we, we finally got into what we call an assembly area you know, of our company. And that's when then we were in that area maybe better part of a day. And that's when we received our orders to, to, uh, to attack. And this is D-Day? Plus two. two. Yes, okay. plus two at that time. That's okay. plus two. That's, so you uh, arrived at the, the, the initial assault that Sefton and that group was involved was the first day. Exactly. You came on the second on the day. The second day. Okay. Yeah. All right. right. The D all plus right. one, right? Okay. Yeah. So now you're all assembled there. What are we talking about? Hundreds? Are we talking about thousands? Oh no, talking about the companies. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. We uh, battalion would be in an area. Okay. And we would we would all be like in a room. It would be maybe uh, well, like my platoon. I would have a oh maybe an area of. Uh, Oh, three, four times the size of this okay. room. Okay. Yeah. Now, is there still the sounds of battle going on? Oh yes. Oh, you're, you're just not in the thick of it. Yet, not, you're hearing we're it. We're hearing yeah. it all. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is. We're talking airplanes still. We're talking oh, about yes. Oh, yes. guns going off oh, from sure. the German yes. side, the American exactly. side, loud. And and the big the big noise was the uh, <coughs> were the <coughs> were the rounds coming from the battleships, of course. Yeah. You know, they had the big guns out there, and they were, they would be pounding. Inland, they tried to pound inland where, right. where we were supposed to go. Yeah. 
they tried to neutralize that. So what was your, now that you've gathered together, now there's some semblance of, of order, okay, the, the well, officers are in charge and all that, right, exactly. where do you go, what would you do next? We'd wait for orders to attack. We'd be sure our equipment was all together. We got rid of our gas masks because at that time we got rid of the, the, the clothes for gas, we got rid of all that, so just took it off and just mm -hmm. left it. And uh, just got ourselves organized to to go into an attack. Yeah. So were you assigned a specific place to go yes. and everybody else had their role? To exactly, okay. exactly All right. right, yeah. So where were you, what were you supposed to do? Just have my people organize. Okay. I, did, I didn't do any, I didn't try to do any fighting, nothing like that, because at that point, the whole regiment was gonna fight. Okay. Not just individual, uh, units. Right. The whole unit would go into a, to an attack, and in a, in a, on, that, on those beaches, a division has uh, three regiments, and usually there would be two regiments out in front and one in reserve. And uh, same with the battalions, mm -hmm. and same with the companies. So you're coming in from the side. Right. There's pillboxes. Well, we, there's yeah, oh yeah, big sure. guns. Right, there's right, machine right. gun exactly. things. There's yeah. there's all this. So wh how did you? Wh what was your job to to do? Were you supposed to penetrate a particular area or? At that time, uh, uh, the the the, the, uh, the uh, pillboxes and so on were pretty were pretty much uh, neutralized. Okay. Uh, because uh, and we could it, there was still firing. Uh, out of some areas, yes, but uh, it wasn't the heavy firing that the guys on the D Day. Got, okay. So, yeah. yeah. I, I I interviewed one of the guys that had yeah. to take out one of those pillboxes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. He uh, he won a Bronze Star. Sure. Yeah. Um, so what what was the next what was the next thing that you had to do? Well, the next thing is we finally were given orders and we were given a sector to attack through that sector. And uh, at that time, we had our division online. Next to us was another division. Next to us over there was another division. And the theory was that you'd all go forward at the same time. Sometimes this division over here would, would not have a lot of activity, so they'd move ahead quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Well then, we, you don't like that breach in the line from here back to here, uh, so you'd have to pull them back or catch up with them. Mm. And if their fighting was, uh, was uh, not very heavy, uh, they could move. And, or we could move, mm -hmm. you see. Now, let's try and get, once again, a visual image here. This is all infantry now. You don't have any jeeps, you don't have any trucks, you don't have any tanks. At this time, we don't have any of okay. that. Okay. No, 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 at this time, we're all infantry people. Yeah. Are they still lobbing shells in from the, from the ships? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes, they, they lobbed those ships. I think, I don't know the range of those ships, but it must be 10, 15 miles. And they were lobbing into areas that they knew we were going to have to go to, to penetrate. And uh, a, lot of this, a lot of this land was underwater, you know. And you were road bound. Uh, the fields, they had, they had uh, released uh, streams and so on and flooded the area the Germans had. And uh, so there was a lot of road bound. Eventually, uh, the jeeps and the vehicles got ashore. Mm -hmm. In our division, we had uh, one tank battalion attached to the division. And uh, then the division would take that battalion, break it down, and give it to the regiments unless there had to be a concentration of tanks. And so, like when I finally got down to, uh, to my, a company that I was in, we had two tanks that we could, could operate with. Mm -hmm. And uh, that they were part of the bigger unit, mm -hmm. of course. Were you encountering um, opposition through this period, or were you just basically moving forward? Oh, we, no, no, oh no, we were. We might, within a day or two, we were in what we call hedgerow country, maybe a week. 
And in hedgerow country, uh, if you gained 100 yards a day, you were lucky. It, it was just impossible to. And see, we, we, had not, we were not aware of hedgerow country. They, our intelligence had never uh, specifically talked about it until we got there. And hedgerow country is a, a type of thing where the farmer, uh, the farmers of the town, See, the people live in the town. There are very few farms. The people live in the town, and they all go out. They have a patch of ground outside where they cultivate and, and uh, grow their crops and so on. And it's usually surrounded by these hedgerows. These hedgerows were being perfected <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for over the years. There'd be stones in there and trees and and uh, uh, dirt, and, oh, just all sorts of things. They cleared the, the fields, see? And there'd be a, an opening at the corner so, it, so they'd get their wagons in. But the rest of it would just be this high hedgerow around it, around this tract of land. And uh, the Germans uh, were smart enough to know that if we tried to come through that opening, they had that well covered with it. And so the only other way would be to go over the top of one of these things, which they also had their guns prepared for that, see. So if we would take one of those fields in a day's time, it was luck, we were lucky, really. And this is lobbing hand grenades, uh, mortar exactly. fire. Exactly. Uh, with a lot of 60 millimeter, the small ones you can put on your knee and fire a 60 millimeter mortar. We can do that. Our BIR teams, and Probably automatic rif uh, rifles, they, they were significant there, but as they were used to mostly as like a machine gun. What, what you had to get in position to use them, though, see? <laughs> that was the other problem. Right, right. What happened at night? It's interesting. Uh, we had a an outfit, and they were uh, a light outfit and they could take those lights and catch airplanes and so on see and so some brilliant fella said well what we should do with those uh, light units is bank them up on a crowd on a cloud and reflect them down on the battlefield and with our, our people that could fight all night too see but somebody didn't realize that someplace there, somebody had to rest, you see. And so about two nights of trying to go for a day and night both, we, I suddenly said, I, I, we can't do this. And I, everybody said the same. It was just ridiculous. But uh, yeah, they, I guess they figured you just go forever without sleep, you know. But uh, so um, that's a, that, was the, that was the night fighting. A lot of times we'd have night fighting, yes. Yeah, yeah. You some nights, but remember this: it was light there until ten, eleven o'clock at night. Mm. It was uh, you had daylight. You, you could fight up till ten, eleven o'clock at night. See. When you were fighting, was there a sense of moving forward, or was it moving forward and then back again, and then, or was it always at least some kind of a movement, movement forward? Yes, yes. Okay. If I was in the attacking unit. And I had a couple of my platoons online. I mean, this is when I was coming, but as a as a platoon leader, if I had my squads online, and I I'd, I'd get into a position where it was uh, heavily taken care of by heavily taken care, of, maybe a couple machine guns. Well, then I take my reserve unit and move around the flank and mm -hmm. come in on the flank of these guys. Mm -hmm. Now I had to also be careful of the unit on my right because they those people were over there also. See. Sure. You know, I've heard the stories about the throwing hand grenades across the hedge. They were, you were that close to the oh, enemy yes, sometimes. Oh, yes, right, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you had... There was a lot of hand grenades. A lot. You, it was hard to use weapons because to get them in position and to, to find... Like I say, these hedgerows were good cover places. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only way you'd find a, a weapon being fired at you is to see it fired. So there's a lot of just 
throwing grenades just to, hoping you hit something, you know, that type of thing. So. Was there any artillery backup or, or um, air, no air support? Not, not there. Not in that area. No, okay. indeed. Oh, no, you're too close. Okay. Oh, no, they wouldn't dare fire. Uh, you couldn't have an airplane come in there. Uh -uh. How long did it take you to get through all that? Probably uh, weeks. Yeah. Two or three yeah. Weeks. I'm not looking for exact days because yeah. you can you know, easily look yeah, it up. So weeks. we were talking about weeks of fighting. Uh, yes. Uh, um, did you have enough food to eat, or is oh, it yeah. being supplied from behind, or? Well, you you were getting you get supplies, but you're always on, on what we call the C ration or the K ration, yeah. and uh, and sometimes D the D ration. You did get meals, no. There were no meals for a long time, really. Okay. Really were you allowed time. to use fire to heat stuff up? We did, and that was the, the convenience of the of the, uh, the K ration. It came in a, in a uh, wax box, and that wax box had enough heat in it to heat the ration and your coffee. Yeah. You, you could light that, and, and it was just a small little box, but there was enough wax in it that it would burn for quite a while. You get big. You can heat a ration with that. I know of what you speak. Uh, believe it or not, uh, in Boy Scouts, uh, yeah. when I was going to Boy Scouts, we had all this World War II and Korea-related, you know, K rations and all that. And I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Um, were there daily or or semi, uh, you know, every, every other day or some period of time in which the officers got together and kind of said, uh, you know, this is where we are, this is where these people are, yes. we're making the, okay, so you were keep being you, kept informed. You usually did that every night. And then you'd get the, the, the plan for the next day. But that night, uh, you'd report to casualties and um, report your position where you were to the, to the company commander. And uh, then he outlined the mission for the next day the hill you're to take, or the hedgerow you're to take, or the town, or whatever, and uh, then you make plans to do that. Yeah. How were the casualties handled? They were evacuated very well, really. Okay. Yes. So you had medic, medic groups with oh, you? Sure. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, you hear yeah. the old war movies, medic, medic, oh, and yeah, somebody yeah. would run out there and grab and, them. And, and, and not only a medic, but uh, see, we all had uh, uh, sulfur bags with us. It, oh, Really, quite often, I, the guy's leg would be wide open, you know, and I'd run over and break that stuff a bag and spring it in like salt, you know. And, and then, a, then a medic team would come up afterwards and pick the kid up, get him out of there. But uh, the, 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 you were aware that you shouldn't have a, a disease happen to the guys and you'd get them out as quick as you could. Okay. Uh -huh. um. Once you got through the hedgerows, right. what was the next thing you encountered? Then we went to uh, a kind of a static position. And at that time, uh, a line formed from a town called Perrier down St. Saint Lo, over to Cannes. And uh, it was decided that. Uh, Two divisions would be on that line, and that they uh, would have saturated bombing in front of them. This From was, the air? Yeah. Okay, yeah. This was like about in July, maybe the latter part of July, 26th of July, maybe, someplace in there. And so, and this was the second feat that I'll never forget or sight is these aircraft coming over and they came over for about five hours just bomb 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 it, they did saturate the bombing the only problem is that see we had a, a smoke line out so they could identify where our troops were and a smoke line through the wind had pulled the smoke line back and part of the bombs got our own people so. But uh, but there was enough left, and it was the 5th Infantry Division, 5th, I think. Yeah, it was the 5th, and the 79th. And what they did is they got enough guys together, started, and went through the area. And uh, 
I think Patton was ashore then. I'm sure he was. Mm -hmm. Because that's why they did what we did. We debouched the 4th Armored Division, turned it out through that line that they broke out. Then. Uh, two things. Uh, One, are we talking about open country now? Yes, yeah, open country. Okay. Yeah, that's open country. Large fields, uh, exactly. farmland, exactly. Farm that land. sort of thing. Right. Were there right. farmhouses? And farmhouses, yeah. Okay. And Very two, few farmhouses. Most of the people lived in towns and okay. little villages. And number two, one of the things I've heard on a consistent yeah. basis of the people who were in your area yes. is that one pat once Patton arrived, everything moved quicker. Exactly. Just. So there was yeah. a noticeable change. Oh, absolutely. And you didn't necessarily know it was Patton. It just there was a noticeable exactly. change, and yeah. later you yeah. found yeah. out it was yeah. when he yeah. actually yeah. arrived. We were on a line out of uh, Pay. Eh? We were on a line to Mayenne and Le Mans out in France, and. Uh, it broke loose so much we just got on trucks and rode. We didn't walk. We, we rode to the next. Mm -hmm. he, he had them so mixed up. He, he, when Fourth Armored broke out, they, they just went crazy, mm -hmm. truly. They did, just went crazy. And, you know, it was easy. Uh, I always laughed about that. They'd say, well, the advance is so-and-so, but it would be one tank going out there about five miles ahead of everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, that's just about not that bad, but it was yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. I've always laughed about our, our infantry people. You know, you always had um, the companies online, and the battalion, the battalion, and the companies, and then the platoons. And so the platoon would have uh, three platoons, and you'd have two out in front, and then that platoon leader would always take two squads and put those out in front. And that squad leader would say to about two guys, get out there and see what's out there in front of us. <laughs> well, and they'd say, I'd read it, it starts and stripes, the, the you know, allies are advancing. And I always think about it, there's one guy out there walking ahead of everybody else. <laughs> and that's really what it was. It was a, it was a, a uh, it wasn't a massive front going, if, I, if that's what I mean, that's what I'm thinking of. It, it wasn't that, it was a, it was a, a, a salient. Mm -hmm. was now, you just mentioned Stars and Stripes. So you were actually getting newspapers? Oh, A few days eventually, behind? Eventually, or? eventually, eventually you'd get yeah, one. Yeah, so you weren't getting them daily or anything oh, like no, that. Oh, no, they were yeah. published, but we, we'd never get them. It, uh, we were glad to get uh, rations, really, mm -hmm. and socks. It was a big thing to get socks. Yeah. A big, a big uh, threat in, in uh, warfare is uh, trench foot. Mm -hmm. And if you have a man change his socks every night, well, when he takes those old socks off and gets ready to put the new ones on, he rubs his feet and, and uh, gets some circulation in and puts the new ones on. And that's the, that's the theory, to get the man to, to, there's action in his feet, you know. So you're not bathing during this period of time? Oh, no, 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 no. Unless you come to a stream and you jump in it. <coughs> oh, no, no, we didn't have any bath units for a long time, mm -hmm. a long time. Yeah. Um, we had mentioned earlier uh, you had talked about uh, how you were impressed with, you know, the medics and the evacuation of wounded and 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 casualties. Did you see the same with the Germans? I mean, when you were moving forward, were there bare areas where you know that you were shooting at guys and they're not there, or were they just bodies laying all over? There was the place? a lot. Of, there were quite a few bodies. Okay. Yeah, they had to some The Germans are, are a very principled and, and very um, policed group of people. They follow orders truly. And uh, it was a, it was rare if you'd see an enemy dead. Okay. It's only if you were static and and they were there and we were here and you might be for a day shooting at each other. There might be some dead laying out on the field. Yeah. But that was rare. It uh, they they were disciplined just as we were. Yes. To take care of your wounded. Okay. And you're dead. Yeah. Um. Once you got through the, 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 the fields, if you will, and the, and the intensive uh, pounding by the, 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 the air power, where did you now move into that area that got pounded by the yes. bombs? What did you see? I mean, what was, what were the, the, what was the oh. result of it? Well, that's, that's the, the enemy at that point. They were so stunned that uh, they had no fighting ability. Oh, no. It, well, the thing could be bombed for about four or five hours with heavy bombers in a very small area, a very concentrated area. Was it a town? No, it was in fields. 
Oh, wow. It was probably, oh, maybe, I would even say it was miles wide. Maybe a mile wide, mm -hmm. the area. So when you moved into the area, what did you see? Just what was left. Big holes. Just, uh, yeah, these bombers, they, they, they were our, our big bombers. Mm -hmm. they, they flew over and then you go back and refu uh, refuel and uh, get uh, more munitions and go back and do it again. It was just a constant stream of, of, these air, of this aircraft. So was there any opposition when you moved into that area, or was no, it pretty, it was no. just devastated? Yeah, just, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Where did you go from there then? You just moved through that area? Oh, that, yeah, so that's when I said we went down to Le Mans and to Maine and uh, started to go down to Fontainebleau where we ran out of gas. At that now, so point. far you have not been hurt. Oh, once I was hurt, oh, I was hurt in, uh, in, uh, Bocadre, which is, uh, oh, maybe the third or fourth day I was there. What happened? I just hit the arm in, in, uh, in, in my this area, in by my side. It was shrapnel wound. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. What you would call a flesh wound, or you yeah, were right. able to continue, in other words, you didn't have to go. No, I got evacuated. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they, they took me out. And uh, I, was, I was out about, uh, oh, maybe three or four days. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, we have a, a van in, uh, in uh, the town of Perrier in, in France, which is about 10 miles from the beach. And uh, he took it upon himself to kind of become the historian for our division. And he was a boy of 14 at the time of the war. And uh, he, he became a, a a person with a, a, like a lame, you know, for the, for the consumer's power or whatever it is over there. And he started to find all these artifacts, you know, and all these things that, uh, that the 90th Division had been in the area. So, so he started collecting them all. And, and then he, he got names and he started writing people. And, and uh, today he has a nice big museum of all these things he picked up. Uh, he, he was given a permission by, uh, by our government to come over and go into our archives and uh, get information about the division. Mm. He's the one instrumental for, uh, for uh, placing our monuments on, on the beaches. Uh, he's responsible for the museum on the beach. He, he, just, mm. he just did everything, this, this one guy. And so Bill Sefton and I were over there in 1977, and um, our wives. And so we went to visit this man. His name was Henry, Henry, Henri Lefauve. So we went to visit Henry, and he had us for dinner. He was just tickled to death to see us. He had us eat dinner, lunch, and then dinner. And uh, so he said, well, I want to show you what I have. And he took us, the house was just overrun with all this stuff, you know. <laughs> and so he opened this book. And it said, uh, he said, I'm going to show you this. He opened the book, and it said, uh, Lieutenant Horner was wounded at Boca Dre today. Imagine that. He had it in that darn book. Yeah. And I don't know how he got that. Yeah. But he had my name and where I was wounded in that oh. book of his. You knew that this is, uh, you're that much closer to the war. You recognize that, of course. You knew about the Battle of Britain, you knew about the exactly. bombings you and all that. Okay. All that knowledge. All right. Yes, all right, yes. Yeah. And we were stationed out, uh, our battalion was put out into a, a place, uh, a huge farm called Get Acres, Get Acres. I've gone there since, and it's, it's, a, great, it's a great area, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, So there's a farmhouse and then you guys bivouacked farm, out on tents? Out, out in the tents. Okay, so pup tents or? Yeah, we all had uh, two-man tents. Okay. Right? Yeah. And, uh, then we'd, 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 do, we'd do exercises there, uh, our calisthenics, we'd do that a couple times a day. We'd take road marches and so on, just to stay in shape. You know? Was there any interaction with the British? Not a bit. Okay. Not one so bit. you guys were probably insulated? Exactly. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah. We, we had no. The only, in, the only interaction with the British is when we went to the pubs. Okay, yeah. well. Yeah. And, what was uh, the reaction of Yanks was, being in these? It, uh, they were, 
Well, we were spending money. Yeah. And he accepted that. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of looking for girls and, and uh, a lot of that sort of thing. And uh, you got into a pub and, and uh, they were great for darts and so they'd always say, well, come on and play darts. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it was, it was uh, nothing nasty. It was right. all, all just glad to see you were here. And, now, were these soldiers, British soldiers that are no, in there? No, oh, this no, is just a, okay, all civilians, all civilians. Okay. just civilians, not soldiers, just okay. civilians, yeah. All right. No, we had, we had no contact with the British soldiers, okay. no. All right, so um, the calisthenics, the training, what was the next step? What, what happened next? Well, then we, re we received notice that uh, we're going to, to uh, go to uh, uh, France. And... Uh, I get it. I take a, We had. There were so many officers that were so. They should not have been. See, but as an example, our our battalion commander. He's a lieutenant colonel. And he had little knowledge, really. And, and he said. Now he said uh, he called the officers in, and, and uh, he said, "Now we're gonna, we're gonna uh, pack up our things, and on your, on your bags and so on." Uh, stencil, uh, so and so, Etusa, E T O U S A. He had, apparently that's a town in France. He said <laughs> he didn't recognize it was E T O, the United States of America. You know, he said, apparently that's a town in France. He said, you know, that, those little things stuck in your mind. You thought, my Lord, this is the guy leading me. You know, <laughs> and so, but we well, we all packed and uh, got our men all organized and. And uh, got on, got out of the camp site. Now, since you're an officer, were you briefed on where you're going? And uh, uh, not, not quite yet. Okay. Not quite yet. Because we know what's coming. Yes. I mean, this oh, is yeah. one of the greatest invasions yes. in the history, oh, yes. and it was one of the greatest secrets as well. Yeah, exactly. And you had, to, and we were eventually when we got to the next stage. Okay. And that's when. Uh, at that time, that's what the guy told us, that ETO was uh, a town. But at the same time, that's when the briefing came as to what units were going to do what and where and when, and uh, how many units were going to be on board ship, and uh, the ship that you were on. They were all, oh, those were all things that you were told. Jim, once again, I apologize if this sounds like a stupid question, but did you have any idea of the scope of what you were being involved Not in? Not the least. We just knew we were part of something. I did finally recognize it, but at that time, I did not. No, no, we were just, we were just going. And yeah. you had to focus on the immediate men around you. You had to focus on the people that you had to do your job. I, I, I had to take care of my men. Okay. And I didn't care about the two next to me. I just took care of my people. And I saw to it that they had everything that they should have. Did you know at this, during this briefing, did you know that you're going to be stepping down off of ships, getting into boats, going on to the water? Not really. Not yet. Not okay. Yet. No, you didn't. that just happened to you. Really? That's remember when I told you we were doing these cargo nets. Yeah. And then we come to that. We got on, we were on board. We walked on board, you know, on the ship. We walked on board. But to leave the ship, we had to go over cargo nets. And that's the first I recognized it. That's why I was taught so much <laughs> about how to go down a cargo net. <laughs> because I'll tell you, that's a very dangerous thing. It, uh, you have to go down the whole side of the ship. That net is... I don't know how far. Well, the whole side of the ship down to the sea. Yeah. And down at the sea are the uh, LCIs, the landing craft infantry boats. And, and Steve's doing this yep. and this. And uh, people would fall off of it, get knocked into the side of the boat, into the side of the LCI, and sometimes wouldn't make it, sometimes would. It just, that was the... That was the first experience, really. But uh, when we got, see, we floated around for about two or three days because the weather was such, mm -hmm. and we, uh, it was bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were thinking of putting off the invasion, actually. You know, th this part is portrayed in, in some of the classic movies. Right. 
um, where the guys are standing around, they're sitting around on this ship smoking cigarettes or whatever, and they're, you know, we're supposed to go today, and then yeah. all of a sudden you're not going to go today. Right. Did that happen? I mean, was that? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was one of the, one of the really <coughs> moments that I, I'll never forget was that. We were on a ship, and it was about, we were about ready to, to get on the ladder. And they had it over everybody at a time, you know. And I had 39 guys around me, and, they, and one of them said, uh, Well, Lieutenant, don't you think we ought to say a prayer? And I said, You know, I think we will. And I had in my pocket a little Bible, a little Bible, not, not a huge number of things, just a little thing. And it had, uh, it had the 23rd Psalm in there. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's the one who will walk in the valley Shadow, of that. So yeah, yeah. In the Shadow of death. And so I said, I, I'll read this to you. And boy, I'll tell you, uh, there were tears, there was, everybody was, and, and we all were the same, really, at, uh, because we didn't know. At that point, we suddenly realized that this was pretty serious yeah. at that point. And uh, then we load, loaded into our LCI. And you have full packs on, you're, oh, you're loaded for bear. Oh, oh everything. Because you they, see that in the movies too. Of ammunition just, yeah. and, and ammunition and food and water, and everything on your back, everything you have is on your back. One of the infantrymen that was there on D-Day, the first, you know, the first day at Omaha, mm -hmm. talked about guys slipping off of the rope and literally sinking down. Exactly. Exactly right. So you actually I didn't saw... Ha I didn't have that. You guys, you guys we, all got on board. We got into boats, but okay. some of our guys, some of the, a couple of my guys slipped off of the net and fell the length of the ship down into the water. And all that, uh, all that equipment on them, you know, it wasn't nice, but that's... What so happened. they went down completely? Yeah, so, yes. So how many did you end up with on the boat? I, the boat holds 39 men. Right. The LCI. And I probably had about 35. Yeah. Yeah, about, I'd say about 35. This is choppy, rocky water. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's stories about but, guys getting sick. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. You were sick on board the boat going over. You know. And then what happens, see, that boat pulls alongside the cargo net, and it loads. And then it goes back out and makes a huge circle. Uh, it gets in with other boats that have already been loaded. And you just go in a big circle until the whole group is off the ship, ready for the assault. And then they break out in a straight line and go ashore. Jim, the scope and the magnitude of this operation must have oh. dawned on you at this point. It did at that time. Finally did. And I'll tell you what. And I can imagine, I, I, to this day, I can imagine the Germans in, the, in their bunkers and so on. They went to bed on June the 5th. And there's nothing out there. And June the 6th, they look out there, and there's 5,500 ships. 5,500 ships that came from all over the world. And they were in their berth, they were assigned. Imagine this. Can you imagine such an number? Whoever thought of that, I'll never, I'll, that guy was smart. Because, because these, these, and they're not just little boats, they're ships. All of, 5,500 of them were there, all lined up. Imagine the Germans waking up the next morning looking out there and saying, what, what's this? <laughs> but that's what it was. They were just, and they had everything there. Carriers, they, they, everything was there. I mean, the Navy was there. Just destroyers and battleships, and the battleships especially were about um, three or four miles offshore firing their, their So or let's, let's get a visual and, a, and an audible. And, there's noise going on now. Oh, the tire there's noise. All these, all these ships are firing. So even as you're stepping down off of the, oh, to yes. get this, they're already firing. Oh, so you're, sure, okay. absolutely. And the aircraft are going over and, uh, and, and uh, taking out positions and dropping their bombs. And, oh, it's that absolute chaos at that time. And, you know, you all had, uh, every person, every unit had their designated area that they were to get to. And I'll never forget, uh, after this, I was told, I heard about it, but at the time I, I happened with it, 
uh, there was an officer by the name of Teddy Roosevelt. He was a brigadier general and the son of the, the president, oh. Roosevelt. And he was one of the officers in charge of our unit. And uh, we landed, uh, the Navy put us ashore about a mile or a mile and a half off of our designated landing area. And so now we're all coming ashore. We had no fire coming at us. We just came ashore. Down this way. That's where the fight went. And Roosevelt looked that around and he, he saw what was happening. We're all there. We we're ashore. And he came out and told all the, the commanders, he said, uh, well, the fighting's down there. Let's go down there. And we turned the whole unit in that direction and went down the beach. We went down to the, to the uh, area. Were you in Higgins boats or some other LS? LCI. LCIs, okay. Yeah. All right. They were made by Higgins. Landing I interviewed craft. a guy who yeah. brought yeah. the demolition team on yeah. one of those That's things. Right. Yeah. yeah. Landing craft infantry. Yeah. yeah. So let's get a let's get a visual image now. You you you're actually heading towards the beach, but the fighting is not there. Not there. No. Okay, but you're hearing it and you're seeing oh, no, off yeah, the distance. It's all down in it's the all desert, there. but that's where we were landing. So then, did the boats just shift over and no, we you, went you landed? You went ashore. We went ashore. That's so you right. actually landed on the beach without any opposition. Exactly right. Yeah. Wow. Not a bit. We turned and then we got opposition. Well, yeah, but, well, but yeah. But at, at that point, yeah. And that was the first. That was now that I'll come to that point. I said about fire. The first round. That I heard thump in the, the area I was. I suddenly realized that somebody was shooting at me. And that's the first time I turned to become an infantry officer. Because I had no, I had no feeling about that up to that time. But I suddenly realized that somebody was trying to kill me. And I changed my whole attitude at that point. That was first rounds, that's all. And I thought, hey, if it's not us, it's going to be them. And that's, that, that was the first time that I recognized that, I think you asked me earlier about when did you yeah. come in to realize about combat, and that was the first moment, that first round that came at me, I suddenly recognized that. Uh, Let's try and get a, a visual image. You're, you're still with your full packs and all that, so well, you didn't have to land in the water and struggle in the water. Well, you guys, oh, well, you did. Oh, yes, yes. They, put, they didn't put you ashore, they put you on. We landed out and uh, see we had impregnated, gas impregnated clothes on besides our regular clothes. And when you landed in the water, well then you're just, you're, uh, you could sink really. You're, you had so much uh, pack on yeah. and so much, uh, so much equipment. Yeah. And, and then this, and it's this greasy wear that you had on got in inside it and inside your uh, clothes and inside your body to your body and that would pull you down you see because that was uh, it was gas impregnated why the, why gas impregnated i don't understand well they thought we were going to have gas attacks oh well, we had gas uh, gas masks Mass, that's up, right sure. yeah, yeah that's right okay and our clothes were impregnated for uh, for gas attack okay and uh so that that all Oh, a lot of uh, some people would drown out there because they couldn't get up. They couldn't get, to, and they they put us ashore about. Oh, uh, well, we were, I'd say, hip to waist uh, waist deep in water, and of course the waves would come in, and, you know. And, but uh, I'd say it was that at least that. Yeah. So, out of your thirty-five guys, did they all make it to the beach? Yes, most okay. of those guys. Yeah, we all did at that time. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So now you're on the beach, yeah. and there's people on your right, on your left, just exactly. scattered, and more people coming in, more exactly. people coming in. Exactly. Um, but the noise is off to the side. You're yeah. not. You're not actually we're not being in shot. The noise. Okay. No, 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 no. So an officer comes by and says, "We're heading in this direction." Exactly. And That's you start marching in the sand. We start. We 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 didn't just march to the column. We spread out. Spread out. Know, okay. And, um, and uh, in a in a formation you'd fight with. You know. It was, you never kept people closer than five uh, yards apart uh, because if a mortar round had come in and you had them closer, you'd lose more people. So you always kept people about five yards apart. So as you're 
moving forward with, with this whole group of people, you're coming in from the side now, exactly. as the rest of the guys are coming in exactly right. full frontal assault. Right. Right. And this is when you heard the thump. Oh yeah. Somewhere around there. Then what happened? I mean, what did you get into the thick of it at that point, or was it well, gradual? Or the, oh, the, well, the, the thick of it was later on. Actually, okay. we find it. We 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 got into a. We we finally got into what we call an assembly area. You know, our company, and that's when then, we were in that area maybe. Better part of a day. And that's when we received our orders to. To, uh, to attack. And this is D-Day? Plus two. two. Yes, okay. plus two. At that time, that's okay. plus two. That's so you that. arrived, a, the, the, the initial assault that Sefton and that group was involved was the first day. Exactly. You came on the second on the day. the second day, okay. yeah. All right. right. A D plus right. one, right. Okay. Yeah. So now you're all assembled there. What are we talking about? Hundreds? Are we talking about thousands? Oh, no. We're talking about the companies. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. We, a uh, battalion would be in an area. Okay. And, and we, would, we would all be like in a room. It would be, be maybe uh, well, like my platoon, I would have a, oh, maybe an area of uh, oh, three, four times the size of this okay. room. Okay. Yeah. Now, is there still the sounds of battle going on? Oh yes. Oh, you're, you're just not in the thick of it. Yet. You're hearing it. We're hearing it all. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> this is this is. We're talking airplanes still. We're talking oh, about yes. Oh, yes. guns going off oh, from sure. the German yes. side, the American fact, side, right. loud. And and the big the big noise was the uh, <coughs> were the <coughs> were the rounds coming from the battleships. Of course, yeah. you know they had the big guns out there, and they were, they would be pounding inland. They tried to pound. Where, where we were supposed to go. They tried to neutralize that. So what was your, now that you've gathered together, now there's some semblance of, of order, okay, the, the right. officers are in charge and all that, right. exactly. where do you go, what would you do next? We'd wait for orders to attack. We'd be sure our equipment was all together. We got rid of our gas mask because at that time we got rid of the, the, the clothes for gas. We got rid of all that, so just took it off and just mm -hmm. left it. And uh, just got ourselves organized to to go into an attack. Yeah. So were you assigned a specific place to go, yes. and everybody else had their role? Exactly, okay. exactly All right. right. Yeah. So where were you? What were you supposed to do? Just have my people organized. Okay. I did. I didn't do any. I didn't try to do any fighting. Nothing like that, because at that point. The whole regiment was going to fight, okay. not just individual uh, units. Right. The whole unit would do it to an attack. And in a, in a, on, that, on those beaches, a division has uh, three regiments, and usually there would be two regiments out in front and one in reserve. And uh, same with the battalions, mm -hmm. same with the companies. So you're coming in from the side. Right. There's pillboxes, there's yeah, oh yeah, big so guns, right, there's machine right, right. gun exactly. things, there's, yeah. there's all this. So wh how did you, wh what was your job to, to do? Were you supposed to penetrate a particular area or? At that time, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, pillboxes and so on were, pre were pretty much uh, neutralized. Okay. Uh, because, uh, and we could, it, they were still firing. Uh, out of some areas, yes, but uh, it wasn't the heavy firing that the guys on the D Day. Got, okay. So, yeah. yeah. I, I I interviewed one of the guys that had yeah. to take out one of those pillboxes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. He uh, he won a bronze star. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what what was the next what was the next thing that you had to do? Well, the next thing is we finally were given orders and we were given a sector to attack through that sector. And uh, at that time we had our division online. Next to us was another division. Next to us over there was another division. And the theory was that you'd all go forward at the same time. Sometimes this division over here would, would not have a lot of activity, so they'd move ahead quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Well then, we, you don't like that breach in the line from here back to here, uh, so you'd have to pull them back or catch up with them. Mm -hmm. And if their fighting was, uh, was uh, not very heavy, uh, they could move. And, or we could move, mm -hmm. you see. Now, let's try and get, once again, a visual image here. 
This is all infantry now. You don't have any jeeps, you don't have any trucks, you don't have any tanks. But at this time, we don't have any of okay. that. Okay. No, no, no. At this time, we're all infantry people. Yeah. Are they still lobbing shells in from the from the ships? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. They, they lob those ships. I think, I don't know the range of those ships, but it must be 10, 15 miles. And they were lobbing into areas that they knew we were going to have to go to, to penetrate. And uh, a lot of this a lot of this land was underwater, you know. And you know, you're roadbound. Uh, the fuels they had they had uh, released uh, streams and so on and flooded the area the Germans had. And uh, so there was a lot of roadbound. Eventually, uh, the jeeps and the vehicles got ashore. Mm -hmm. In our division, we had uh, one tank battalion attached to the division. And uh, then the division would take that battalion and break it down and give it to the regiments, unless there had to be a concentration of tanks. And so, like when I finally got down to, uh, to my, a company that I was in, we had two tanks that we could operate with. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that they were part of the bigger unit, mm -hmm. of course. Were you encountering um, opposition through this period, or were you just basically moving forward? Oh, we, no, no. Oh, no, we were. We might, within a day or two, we were in what we call hedgerow country, maybe a week. And in hedgerow country, uh, if you gained 100 yards a day, you were lucky. It, it was just impossible to. And see, we, we, had not, we were not aware of hedgerow country. They, our intelligence had never uh, specifically talked about it until we got there. And hedgerow country is a, a type of thing where the farmer, uh, the farmers of the town, see, the people live in the town, there are very few farms. The people live in the town and they all go out, they have a patch of ground outside where they cultivate and, and uh, grow their crops and so on. And it's usually surrounded by these hedgerows. These hedgerows were being perfected <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for over the years. It'd be stones in there and trees and, and uh, uh, dirt and oh, just all sorts of things. They cleared the, the fields. See? And There'd be an opening at the corner so, you, so they'd get their wagons in. But the rest of it would just be this high hedgerow around it, around this tract of land. And uh, the Germans uh, were smart enough to know that if we tried to come through that opening, they had that well covered with things. And so the only other way would be to go over the top of one of these things, which they also had their guns prepared for that. See? So if we would take one of those fields in a day's time, it was luck. we were lucky, really. And this is lobbing hand grenades, uh, mortar exactly. fire. Exactly. Uh, and with a lot of 60 millimeter, the small ones you can put on your knee and fire a, a 60 millimeter mortar. We can do that. Our BIR teams, the Browning Automatic Rif uh, Rifles, they, they were significant there. And as they were used to mostly as like a machine gun. What, you what, had to get in position to use them, though, see? That was the other problem. Right, right. What happened at night? It's interesting. Uh, we had a, an outfit, and they were uh, a light outfit. And they could take those lights and catch airplanes and so on, see? And so... Some brilliant fella said, well, what we should do with those uh, light units is bank them up on a, crowd, on a cloud and reflect them down on the battlefield. And with our, our people that could fight all night too, see. But somebody didn't realize that someplace there, somebody had to rest, you see. And so about two nights of trying to go for a day and night both, we, I suddenly said, I, I, we can't do this. And I, everybody said the same. It was just ridiculous. But uh, yeah, they, I guess they figured you just go 
forever without sleep, you know. But the, so um, that's a, that was the that was the night fighting. A lot of times we'd have night fighting. Yes, yeah, yeah. You'd some nights, but remember this: it was light there until ten, eleven o'clock at night. Yeah. It was uh, you had daylight. You, you could fight up till ten, eleven o'clock at night. See. When you were fighting, was there a sense of moving forward? Or was it moving forward and then back again, and then, or was it always at least some kind of a movement, movement forward? Yes, yes. Okay. If I was in the attacking unit, and I had a couple of my platoons online, I mean, this is when I was company, but as a as a platoon leader, if I had my squads online, and I I'd, I'd get into a position where it was uh, heavily taken care of by heavily taken care of, maybe a couple machine guns. Well, then I take my reserve unit and move around the flank and mm -hmm. come in on the flank of these guys. Mm -hmm. Now I had to also be careful of the unit on my right because they, those people were over there also. See. Sure. You know, I've heard the stories about the throwing hand grenades across the hedge. Were, you were that close to the oh, enemy yes. sometimes. Oh, yes. Right. yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you had... There was a lot of hand grenades. A lot. You. It was hard to use weapons because to get them in position and to, to find, like I say, these hedgerows were good cover places. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only way you'd find a, a weapon to be fired at you is to see it fired. Okay. So there was a lot of just throwing grenades just to, hoping you hit something, you know, that type of thing. So. Was there any artillery backup or, or um, air, air okay. support? Not, not there. Not in that area. No, okay. indeed. Oh, no, you're too close. Okay. Oh, no, they wouldn't dare fire. Uh, you couldn't have an airplane come in there. Uh -uh. How long did it take you to get through all that? Probably uh, weeks. Yeah. Two or three yeah. Weeks. I'm not looking for exact days because yeah. you can you know, easily look yeah, them up. So weeks. we were talking about weeks of fighting. Uh, yes. Uh, um, did you have enough food to eat or is oh, it yeah. being supplied from behind? Or Well, you, you were getting, you'd get supplies, but you're always on, on what we call the C ration or the K ration yeah. and, uh, and sometimes D, the D ration. You did get meals, no. There were no meals for a long time, really. Okay. Really were you allowed time. to use fire to heat stuff up? Well, you did, and that was the, the convenience of the, of the, uh, the K-ration. It came in a, in a uh, wax box, and that wax box had enough heat in it to heat the ration and your coffee. Yeah. You, you could light that, and, and it was just a small little box, but there was enough wax in it that it would burn for quite a while. You, got big, you can heat a ration with that. I know of what you speak. Uh, believe it or not, uh, in Boy Scouts, uh, yeah. when I was going to Boy Scouts, we had all this World War II and Korea-related, you know, K rations and all that. And I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Um, were there daily or or semi, uh, you know, every, every other day or some period of time in which the officers got together and kind of said, uh, you know, this is where we are, this is where these people are, yes. we're making the, okay, so you were keep, being you, kept informed. You usually did that every night. And then you'd get the, the, the plan for the next day. But that night, uh, you'd report to casualties and um, report your position where you were to the, to the company commander. And uh, then he outlined the mission for the next day the hill you're to take, or the hedge road you're to take, or the town, or whatever. And uh, then you make plans to do that. Yeah. How were the casualties handled? They were evacuated very well, really. Okay. Yes. So you had medic, medic groups with oh, you? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. You hear the old war movies, medic, medic, oh, and yeah, somebody yeah. would run out there and grab and, them. And, and, and not only a medic, but uh, see, we all had uh, uh, sulfur bags with us. It, well, really quite often, I, the guy's leg would be wide open, you know, and I'd run over and break that sofa bag and spring it in like salt, you know. And, and then, a, then a medic team would come up afterwards and pick the kid up, get him out of there. But uh, you, the, the, you were aware that you shouldn't have a, a disease happen to the guys and you get them out as quick as you could. Okay. Um. Once you got through the hedgerows, right. what was the next thing you encountered? 
then we went to uh, a kind of a static position. And at that time, uh, a line formed from a town called Perrier down St. Saint Lo, over to Caen. And uh, it was decided that uh, two divisions would be on that line and that they uh, would have saturated bombing in front of them. This From the was, air? Yeah. Okay, yeah. This was like about in July, maybe the latter part of July, 26th of July, maybe, someplace in there. And so, and this was the second feat that I'll never forget or sight is these aircraft coming over. And they came over for about five hours. Just bomb, bomb, bomb. It, they did saturate the bombing. The only problem is that, see, we had a, a smoke line out so they could identify where our troops were. And a smoke line through the wind had pulled the smoke line back and part of the bombs got our own people. So. Mm. But, uh, but there was enough left and it was the 5th Infantry Division, 5th, I think. Yeah, it was the 5th and the 79th. And what they did is they got enough guys together, started and just went through the area. And uh, I think Patton was ashore then. I'm sure he was. Mm -hmm. Because that's why they did what we did. We debouched the 4th Armored Division, turned it out through that line that they broke out. Uh, two things. One. Are we talking about open country now? Yes, yeah, open country. Okay. Yeah, that's open country. Large fields, uh, exactly. farmland, exactly. Farm that sort of thing. Right. Were there right. farmhouses? And... Farmhouses, yeah. Okay. And Very two... few farmhouses. Most of the people lived in towns and okay. little villages. And number two, one of the things I've heard on a consistent yeah. basis of the people who were in your area is that one pat once Patton arrived, everything moved quicker. Exactly. Just. So there was a noticeable change. Oh, absolutely. And you didn't necessarily know it was Patton. It just there was a noticeable exactly. change, and yeah. later you yeah. found out it was yeah. when he yeah. actually yeah. arrived. We were on a line out of uh, Pay. Eh? We were on a line to Mayenne and Le Mans out in France, and uh, it, it broke loose so much we just got on trucks and rode. We didn't walk. We we rode to the next. Mm -hmm. He he had him so mixed up. He he, when Fourth Armored broke out. They, they just went crazy, truly. They did, just went crazy. And, you know, it was easy. Uh, I always laughed about that. They'd say, well, the advance is so-and-so, but it would be one tank going out there about five miles ahead of everybody else. See? But they, they, that's just about not that bad, but it was yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. I've always laughed about our, our infantry people. You know, you always had... Um, the companies online, and then the battalion, the battalion, and the companies, and then the platoons. And so the platoon would have uh, three platoons, and you'd have two out in front, and then that platoon leader would always take two squads and put those out in front. And that squad leader would say to about two guys, get out there and see what's out there in front of us. <laughs> and they'd say, I'd read it, it starts to stretch, the, the allies are advancing, and I always think about it, there's one guy out there walking ahead of everybody else. <laughs> and that's really what it was. It was a, it was a, a uh, it wasn't a massive front going, in fact, if that's what I mean, that's what I'm thinking of. It, it wasn't that, it was a, it was a, a, a salient. Mm -hmm. was, now you just mentioned Stars and Stripes, so you were actually getting newspapers? Oh, a few days behind, or yeah. One. So you weren't getting them daily or anything oh, like that. Oh no, they were yeah. published, but we we never get them. It's, uh, we were glad to get uh, rations, really, mm -hmm. and socks. It was a big thing to get socks. Yeah, a big a big uh, threat in in uh, warfare is uh, trench foot, mm -hmm. and if you have a man change his socks every night, well, when he takes those old socks off and gets ready to put the new ones on, he rubs his feet and and. Uh, get some circulation in it and put some new ones on. And that's the, that's the theory, to get the man, to, to, there's action in his feet, you know. So you're not bathing during this period of time? Oh, no, 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 no. Unless you come to a stream and you jump in it. 
Oh, no, no. We didn't have any bath units for a long time. Mm -hmm. A long time. So. Um, we had mentioned earlier, uh, you had talked about uh, how you were impressed with you know, the medics and the evacuation of wounded and, and, and yeah. casualties. Did you see the same with the Germans? I mean, when you were moving forward, were there bare areas where you know that you were shooting at guys and they're not there, or were they just bodies laying all over? There, was a lot of, there were quite a few bodies. Okay. Yeah. They had the some prisoners. The Germans are, are very principled and, and very um, policed group of people. They follow orders, truly. <clears throat> and uh, it, was a, it was rare if you'd see an enemy dead. It's only if you're static and, and they were there and we were here and you might be for a day shooting at each other. There might be some dead laying out on the field. Yeah. But that was rare. It, uh, they, they were disciplined just as we were, yes. To take care of your wounded. Okay. And you're dead, yeah. Um, once you got through the, 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 the fields, if you will, and the, and the intensive uh, pounding by the, 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 the air power. Where did you now move into that area that got pounded by the yes, bombs? What right. did you see? I mean, what was what were the, the what was the oh. result of it? Well, that's that's the the enemy at that point. They were so stunned that uh, they had no fighting ability. Oh no! It was, well, the thing could be bombed for about four or five hours with heavy bombers in a very small area, a very concentrated area. Was it a town? No, it, was, it feels. Oh, wow. And it was probably, oh, maybe, I wouldn't even say it was miles wide. Maybe a mile wide, mm -hmm. the area. So when you moved into the area, what did you see? Just what was left. Big holes. Just, uh, yeah, these bombers, they, they, they were our, our big bombers. Mm -hmm. they, they flew over, and then you go back and refu uh, refuel and uh, get uh, more munitions, and come back and do it again. It was just a constant stream of, of, these air of this aircraft. So, was there any opposition when you moved into that area, or was no, it pretty? It was no. just devastated. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Where did you go from there? Then you just moved through that area. Well, that, yeah. So that's when I said we went down to Le Mans and to Man and uh, started to go down to Fountain Blue where we ran out of gas. At that now, so point. far you have not been hurt? Oh, it's, I was hurt. Oh, I was hurt in, uh, in uh, Boken Ray, which is, uh, oh, maybe the third or fourth day I was there. What happened? I just hit the arm in, in, uh, in, in my this area by my side. It was shrapnel wound. Oh, otherwise. okay. Yeah. What you would call a flesh wound or? You yeah. were able to continue, in other words, you didn't have to go... No, I got evacuated. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they, they took me out. And uh, I, was, I was out about, uh, oh, maybe three or four days. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, we have a, a van in, uh, in uh, the town of Perrier in, in France, which is about 10 miles from the beach. And uh, he took it upon himself to kind of become the historian for our division. And he was a boy of 14 at the time of the war. And uh, he, he became a, a, a person with a, 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 like a layman, you know, for the, for the consumer's power or whatever it is over there. And he started to find all these artifacts, you know, and all these things that, uh, that the 90th Division had been in the area. So, so he started collecting them all. And, and then he, he got names, and he started writing people, and, and uh, today he has a nice big museum of all these things he picked up. Uh, he, he was given a permission by, uh, by our government to come over and go into our archives and uh, get information about the division. He's the one instrumental for, uh, for uh, placing our monuments on, on the beaches. He's responsible for the museum on the beach. He just, mm. he just did everything, this, this one guy. And so Bill Sefton and I went over there in 1977, and um, our wives. And so we went to visit this man. His name is Henry, Henri Lefauve. So 
So we went to visit Henry, and he had us for dinner. He was just tickled to death to see us. He had us eat dinner, lunch, and then dinner. And uh, so he said, well, I want to show you what I have. And he took us, the house was just overrun with all this stuff, you know. <laughs> and so he opened this book, and it said, uh, he said, I want to show you this. He opened the book, and it said, uh, Lieutenant Horner was wounded at Boca Dre today. Imagine that. He had it in that darn book. Yeah. And I don't know how he got that. Yeah. But he had my name and where I was wounded in that oh. book of his. Let's hold on for a second. Are right. you changing tape? Sure. Okay, yeah. well, let me know. Right. What time is it? It's 11.30, and why, why, why don't we just take a break right now? Yeah, that's a good idea. Or, left on okay. okay. Well, I go to the turtle.